you know, uh, Bill, Bill mentioned this uh, enormous uh, fraction of the your tax dollars that get washed through the defense industry and come back. Uh, some of them come back to campuses. I, I had mentioned that there are you know, hardly any peace groups left. There are plenty of programs called peace and security. Many, many campuses have peace and security prog programs. They're war programs, right? They're, fi they're fellowships from Lockheed Martin or uh, the Air Force. I periodically go to our, our international security talks here. That, that's, that's who's financing it. But there's one place in the country uh, where there is an authentic uh, effort to understand these things, the Cost of War Project at Brown. And Stephanie is from that project and is going to uh, share what, what they've, they've learned. Um. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Yes, I do have slides. Um, so again, I'm Stephanie Savell. I'm the co-director of the Costs of War Project at Brown University at the Watson Institute. And the goal of the project is to shine light on the hidden or unacknowledged costs of the post-9-11 war on terror, the economic, social, and political costs. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you about that war. And it's not about nuclear weapons. We don't, I'm not an expert on, on nuclear weapons at all. Um, but I feel like as a peace movement, it's really important to make these links. And the only way that nuclear weapons would get used, as people have pointed out, is in the context of conventional war. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the war on terror, which is now the longest running war in US history. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk to you about the vast amounts of money we've committed to that war, which actually dwarf the 1.2 trillion that we're talking about over the next 30 years for nuclear weapons. So President George W. Bush began the global war on terror with Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan in October 2001. And this war has now morphed into an expansive network, shadowy network, of counterterror activity in more places than most of us can possibly imagine. President Obama stopped calling it the war on terror, but it's still the same war that's going on today. And I want to show you something pretty shocking. We put together a map of the current reach of the US war on terror. So it's not just Afghanistan and Iraq. We are actually taking military action against terrorism in 76 countries. So that's 40% of the nations on the planet. Um, you can see there's different categories on the map. And just quickly, there's countries that host US bases or lily pads, countries that are targeted by drone strikes. Those are, one, those are the ones that are striped. Um, many, many places where we are training local forces in counterterrorism, and, uh, and places where we also have US troops on the ground uh, search, searching out terrorists. So according to our estimates of the Cost of War Project, we've spent $5.6 trillion on these wars since 2001. It's really hard to grasp that large of a number. Per taxpayer, that's about uh, $24,000, equal to uh, a year at public university. If you were to break, break that down to the individual level, a Honda Accord, the average down payment on a house. It's also, in 2018, we are spending $32 million per hour as tax, uh, taxpayers on these wars, the war on terror. So what happens? The Pentagon pegs the cost of the post-9-11 wars at uh, $1.5 trillion, which is far less than our estimate. But what they do is they only look at this top budget line, which are um, over, called overseas contingency operations. That's the official war fund. Um, we say you have to look more broadly than this if you're going to understand the true costs of this war. There are increases to the Pentagon base budget that happen every year because of these wars. There are um, there is Homeland Security, which if you're going to talk about offense in countries abroad, th there are portions of Homeland Security that are about defense here on, on US soil. Um, and then, there's about, then there are commitments to veterans, right? So uh, over the next, uh, by, the, by the 2050s or so, um, we draw on economist Linda Billums, who estimates that the US will spend over $1 trillion on veterans' health care and disability by the 2050s. 
uh, based on current obligations. So we do include that in our $5.6 trillion total. The craziest thing is most of this money is borrowed funds, and Elaine was talking about this. Um, so even if we stop spending money on these wars right now, the accumulated interest costs on borrowing from what we've already borrowed will total $8 trillion by the 2050s, and that's not in, included in this $5.6 trillion uh, total that we have. So that's an additional $8 trillion at least uh, that, we, that we can add, and just think about how that's going to affect um, you know, our children's generation. Okay, so just to give you a little bit, a brief background on um, federal spending, you might already know this, but um, the US Treasury divides all federal spending into three groups, mandatory spending, discretionary spending, and interest on debt. About 90% or over 90% of the spending is in the top two categories, mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Um, mandatory spending is made up largely of Social Security and Medicare. These are commitments that we have every year the government has. Um, so when you talk about discretionary spending, that's when you're talking about pretty much everything else. Um, and some people have been mentioning this figure, but um, this is the, the pie chart of discretionary funds in uh, fiscal year 2017. And you can see how the 53% um, of discretionary funds go to the military. And the rest is kind of divvied up in many of the things, many of the other things, infrastructure and all the other things that, that we care about. Um, and just to note that 3% of this goes to science, which includes all NSF and NIH funding. Um, so in 2018, the recently passed omnibus package um, has allocated $700 billion for military, $591 for non-military, so the share is pretty constant at 54% military spending. Um, Trump's requests would bump the, the share, the, the percentage points of, of money going to the military up even higher. Um, by 2023, he's as asking for 65% of, of all discretionary funds to go to the military. Um, I was going to talk about, before I knew Bill was coming, prevalent myths about spending. So we've already talked about the fact that you have to spend money on the Pentagon because it's for the troops, but it's actually half of it goes to these private corporations, right? And then the, the other myth is about jobs. So we have a paper, um, you know, the common claim that, that at least if you spend money on the military, it's going to create jobs. Well, um, there's an economist named Heidi Garrett Peltier. I think she'll be here later today. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, we, she, we have a paper of hers on our site that shows that um, government funds spent in other sectors outside of the military, like education, healthcare, green energy, create far more jobs per dollar spent uh, than military spending. Um, so I want to just close by speaking for a moment about uh, the cultural detachment that we as Americans have in regard to these so-called war on terror. It's not that we don't care about it as a society, but uh, 17 years after it began, we, it's a topic we really, it doesn't really fire a lot of us up. And um, the fact is that we really don't think of ourselves as at war as a nation, and we are. Um, these wars, it's not just the financial costs. We're pass piling this debt onto our children, yes, but we're also killing hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. We're displacing hundreds of thousands more. We're disabling a generation of American veterans. And we're wreaking political and environmental havoc in the Middle East and South Asia in the name of these wars, and now increasingly in Africa. Um, are these costs worth it? Most people, I mean, I assume everyone in this audience would say no. Um, but, but basically, the terrorism is not stopping as a result of our activities. If anything, it's growing. The U.S. is seen as an aggressor, and there are now more terrorist groups than there ever have been before as, as a result of our actions. Um, so I wanted to make a plea, basically, to, to kind of, as we're thinking as a peace movement, we need to think about the war on terror and think about, uh, think about stopping it. And 
you know, Trump's enthusiastic support of the military, the, the kind of fear-based inertia that leads lawmakers to, you know, approve an ever larger military budget. That's all part of, of what we're talking about here. And um, we really need to, as a nation, kind of stem that, that, that flow and, and rise up against it. Thank you. I mean, we tried to make that equivalency with that slide that I showed you of the, of the, you know, what it has cost every single person, right? The National Priorities Project that Heidi's a part of is a great resource on this. They have a, they have a, um, a trade-offs tool on their website so you can see, and they use our figures now for the costs of the war on terror. So you can go to their website and see um, for, ev for the amount of money that we're spending on uh, on, ter on counterterrorism, what could you have gotten instead? Um, so there's there's things like that. I mean, I think I think the bottom line is that we are not talking at all about the war on terror, much less how it's how much it's costing. So just kind of broaching the subject, I find it's not a. Um, I feel like people are talking more these days about. Uh, the issue of nuclear weapons, just because there was that clip, the professor on the, um, Hugh Gusterson on the video was saying, oh yeah, that your, his students are talking about it more because there's a danger of, you know, people see like President Trump could, has his finger on the, on the button, right? But people are not talking about the, the war on terror. So just, just bringing it up and getting people to kind of have this conversation, is this worth it? What are we doing? Um, Senator Durbin, in a in a recent um, debate on the on the in Congress, on this issue of the authorization of of the use of military force, and he was using our map, and he was saying, "Listen, has Congress even d debated the fact that we are in all of these places?" And um, and the answer is definitely not. So just kind of being able to, to kind of talk about these things in a cogent way is, it's not academic, it's just kind of like, let's just talk about it. Yeah. Uh, right, well, what's interesting is that the, there's a strong um, movement uh, on the other side of the political spectrum. So they don't share our goals as far as peace goes, but they do share the desire to reduce the Pentagon budget. And so there's a lot of like libertarian groups that care about um, fiscal conservatism, uh, which the mainstream Republican Party doesn't care about anymore. But the um, but this movement has kind of broken down the the that military spending piece and and said okay well here and they care about having a strong military so um, so it's a kind of a, you know middle of the road argument if you if you will but they but they look at here are the places where there's fraud and there's abuse and then and where you can kind of like reduce that share of the pie and still you know answer the political calls for strong military. Ironically enough, one of the most recent studies that just came out on this was done by the Koch Foundation, um, which again is, goes back to this alignment I was talking about, uh, um, reducing the, the military spending. And um, they feel that there are polls that show that most Americans think that we need to come out of Iraq and Afghanistan, um, but that we've done a good job there, whatever that means. Um, but, but overwhelmingly, I think pro like 60% um, or something like that of Americans are in favor of pulling out. I don't know about the issue of nuclear support for nuclear well, spending. On the, on the Pentagon budget itself. On the Pentagon, people have no clue, basically. That's what the poll showed. People have no clue at all, uh, the scale, the enormity of how much we're spending on the Pentagon. Let me just say, uh, just on, on this particular uh, point, uh, most people in this room have been paying income tax for decades, right, in a half a century. Have any of you ever gotten a report back from the federal government or the IRS or any agency on how that money is spent? No. Americans do not know. They've never seen that pie, pie, pie graph. And in my experience, and I'm at a lot of conferences about housing and transit and education, the only thing that gets through, you put up that pie chart showing that half people's tax dollars go to the Pentagon, and first they don't believe it. They don't believe it. So I'm an educated person. I, I would have known if half my tax dollars. They do not know this. 
So personally, I think that it's extremely important that we get that kind of information out. It's not easy. One little initiative we had this year, it's not on the agenda of this conference, but we're going to move it next year. It's this Taxpayers Information and Transparency Act, where we ask the state to just send people who live in Massachusetts the pie chart on how the federal government, just like your, your city sends you how the property taxes spent, how much for fire, how much for school, uh, et cetera, let people know. If people knew how much was being spent, their attitudes would change. Anyway, let's thank our panel. We